Welcome to this session on uh, overreaching. I'm very grateful uh, to Chris for being able to take part and to discuss some of my work uh, on overreaching. So what is overreaching? Well, it's a defence mechanism whereby equitable interests are swept behind the curtain to enable a purchaser to take uh, free of them. And equitable interests commonly swept behind the curtain in this way are beneficial interests under trusts. Now, it's important for you to remember that um, beneficial interests under trusts are not capable of registration as a land charge in the context of unregistered land, and nor are they capable of registration as notices as claims in registered land. And in the context of registered land, um, the, the authority for that is Section 33 of the Land Registration Act of 2002. So what is the rationale for overreaching? Well, simply put, it's so that a purchaser can purchase land free of any equitable interest and he, can take, uh, he or she can take uh, free of them. And in that sense, it's promoting the dynamic security in land, looking at it, from, at it from, the, from the point of view of the protection of the purchaser. And that then is at the expense of the uh, owner of the equitable interest who has what is termed the static interest in land. Now, where overreaching does not occur, so the converse of what I've just been explaining, the purchaser takes subject to the equitable interest, thereby promoting the static interest in land. And in that scenario, in those circumstances, the normal priority rules would apply. And in the case of registered land, that means the commonly this, the special priority provision in Section 29 of the Land Registration Act of 2002. Now, you'll recall that the combined effect of Section 2, Subsection 2 of the Land Law of Property Act 1925 and Section 27, Subsection 2 of the Law of Property Act 1925 is that where capital monies arise, the capital uh, monies must be paid to at least two trustees for overreaching to occur. Now, for those of you who uh, may be interested in legal history, if you were to look at uh, um, the beginning of my um, article in the Convention in 2017, Overreaching, Getting the Right Balance, I tr trace the history of land registration there and overreaching itself. And it goes, this particular defence mechanism uh, goes back uh, centuries. And um, when we come to the um, Law of Property Act 1925, it's important for you to note that the Law of Property Act 1925 didn't invent overreaching. It just merely regulated the, doc the, the, the defence mechanism, which had been in existence for, for centuries before then. And in fact, in 1925, it was in this two, two two trustee rule was inspired by the provisions of the Settle Land Act of 1882. So I think that's an important thing to, to, to bear in mind when you're when, when you're looking at this particular topic. So to the problems with overreaching, the various problems with regard to overreaching the boundaries of the defence mechanism, I'll just deal with one uh, 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 for now. And one of the problems with this. Um, defence mechanism relates to the arbitrary, the rather arbitrary way in which um, it can operate. Now you remember two famous cases on overreaching, both of which uh, concerned registered land. The first one uh, was Williams and Glynn's Bank against uh, Boland. What you had in that particular case is that the property, registered land, is in the name of Mr Boland. He has a company which isn't uh, uh, doing very well, so he wants to have a capital injection into the company. He goes to the bank, bank agrees to lend him money, which he's going to put into the company. He then signs a mortgage. What happens next? Well, he can't afford the repayments. The bank takes uh, possession proceedings. They get possession against Mr. Boland, obviously. But then Mrs. Boland's in occupation of the property and they must seek possession uh, against her as well. Mrs. Boland didn't take this li lying down. She argued, well, look, um, I've got a, a beneficial interest under a trust here. Um, I've made contributions to the property. I've done this, that and the other. And um, she made out a case to say that she held had a beneficial interest um, arising under an implied constructive trust. And in those circumstances, um, her static security um, won the day. Now, why was that? Um, she argued, well, 
the capital monies in this particular transaction were paid to one trustee because Mr. Boland was holding the property legally for himself, but upon trust for himself and Mrs. Boland uh, beneficially. And because the capital monies, the mortgage advance was only paid to one trustee, then overreaching couldn't take effect. And in those circumstances, the static um, security, Mrs. Boland's beneficial interest won the day. Now, a few years later, came along the case of City of London Building Society against uh, uh, Flegg. And what you had in that particular case was a situation whereby there was Mr. and Mrs. Flegg, their daughter and their son-in-law. And Mr. and Mrs. Flegg um, made a contribution towards the purchase price of uh, the property. And therefore, they held beneficially as... Uh, uh, and under um, a purchase money resulting trust. Now, the property itself was held legally by Mr. and Mrs. Flegg's daughter and their son-in-law. So the two of them held the property legally upon trust for themselves, the daughter and the son-in-law, and also Mr. and Mrs. Flegg. The property was then mortgaged by Mr. and Mrs. Flegg's daughter and son-in-law, and they were unable to... Um, keep up with the mortgage repayments to the City of London Building Society. The City of London Building Society took commenced possession proceedings. They obtained possession uh, um, uh, uh, against Mr. and Mrs. Uh, uh, against Mr. and Mrs. Flegg's daughter and um, son-in-law um, uh, uh, easily enough. But then Mr. and Mrs. Flegg Senior uh, defended the, um, the action and they said, well, Look at the case of um, Mrs. Boland. She was in possession of the property. We're in uh, uh, occupation of the um, of, of, of the property as well. Um, what's the difference if Mrs. Boland won against the bank? Why can't we see off the action here against City of London Building Society? And the court said, no. There's the world of difference between your case, Mr. And Mrs. Flagg and that of Mrs. Boland. In Mrs. Boland's case, the capital monies were paid to one trustee, and that's why Mrs. Boland was able to assert uh, an, an overriding interest by virtue of her, of her rights of occupation to see off the claim against the bank. Unfortunately, the court said, this was the House of Lords, in your particular case, Mr. and Mrs. Flagg, the capital monies were paid to two trustees, namely your daughter and son-in-law. An overreaching in your case can occur. And where overreaching occurs, they said, notwithstanding the fact that you've been uh, uh, in, in occupation, you cannot make out the overriding interest to which those rights attach because it's undermined, it's taken from under your feet because overreaching will take that away. So once that happened, overreaching um, saw off the um, uh, Mr. And Mrs. Flegg's uh, uh, case and the bank was able to um, get a possession order against them. Now, what made it worse for Mr. And Mrs. Flagg was this. The way in which overreaching in theory is meant to work is that, fine, Mr. And Mrs. Flagg lost their rights of occupation in the home. And in theory, their rights then convert into the proceeds of sale and they can follow those through to the trustees and say, can I have the, the, uh, my money back now, uh, which, which I've invested in this particular property so I can buy another property. The problem was with Mr. and Mrs. Flegg that that didn't happen because there was negative equity in the property. So they, they, they lost out um, 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 in, 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 in every way in this particular case. And in my writing, um, I've referred to this in, in my first um, article on overreaching in, the, in 2013, a new paradigm for overreaching again in the conveyance room property lawyer. I call this the numbers game because I, I, I've said it's most unfortunate that um, Mrs. Boland won just because she was fortunate enough to have one trustee and Mr. and Mrs. Flegg lost because they were unfortunate enough to have two trustees. There was no rhyme or, 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 or reason uh, uh, for this. So I've, I've, I've called this the numbers game, trying to, 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 to highlight the rather arbitrary nature 
of the law in this particular area. So in, in my work, I've been trying to suggest uh, put forward reforms to um, overcome uh, 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 the, the, the operation of the defence mechanism from the point of view of its rather arbitrary nature. And in my first article in 2013, a new paragraph for over, a paradigm for overreaching, what I've suggested is that beneficial interests and the trusts, which are at present not capable of registration, should in fact be registered so that the Curtin principle can be breached. That would then give the beneficial owner under a trust uh, a degree of protection. And if they don't uh, uh, afford themselves of that opportunity, an overreaching will um, occur. And in that respect, I've taken inspiration from the, um, the caveat uh, system, which they have uh, in Australia. So if you read my 2013 article, you'll see the arguments that I've made there. Now, one big argument against my proposal is this, that over to take the case of uh, Flegg, it took about 70 years since the passing of the um, uh, Law of Property Act 1925 for the case of Flegg to manifest itself. No one would doubt that this, that this is uh, a harsh case. But the argument against me is, yes, well, it might well be harsh, but it took so long for this uh, 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 case to manifest itself. And cases like this only come along every so often. So for policy reasons, why don't we just um, leave the law as it is? Well, my argument against that is that no matter how infrequent these cases might be, when they do occur, they do uh, cause injustice. And in my 2015 conveyancer article, um, a new model for overreaching, some historical inspiration. I've traced the history of land ownership between 1925 to more recent times. And you can see that home ownership in 1925, when the legislation to regulate overreaching uh, was passed, it wasn't as prevalent as it is now. So we now have a, a, a situation whereby it's quite common for parents to purchase properties with uh, um, uh, their children living together and the problem that we've seen in Flegg because of the prevalence in home ownership in my view is going to increase rather than decrease and that this type of problem is there simmering under the surface. Now in my final article on, on overreaching um, in 2017, again in the Convention on Property Law, getting the balance right, I've looked at it from uh, from an alternative standpoint, rather than uh, as an alternative to the registration of uh, um, trusts, we could regulate the defence mechanism, mechanism through having uh, better restrictions on, on the register in registered land. And that would mean that um, if a restriction was were to be put on, then if there were a harsh case, the matter could then be heard by the um, upper tribunal, the property chamber, and they could look at all the facts of the case. And if it was decided there was a situation like in Flag where there was negative equity, they could say, well, perhaps overreaching shouldn't occur because it would be unfair in this particular case. So that's another way of looking at it. And you can see my arguments for these better restrictions made out in that particular article. Now, overreaching's a relatively slow moving area of the law. There's always something going on behind the scenes, but um, I think that uh, before anything is done about it, um, it'll probably take a human rights challenge um, um, to, 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 to see any changes. The other thing about overreaching is this, that um, although it's a slow moving area of law, it's at the very core of our system of land law. And when you do get um, a case, it usually um, uh, ha ha has fundamental uh, uh, far reaching consequences. And as an example of that, take the recent case of uh, Baker and Craggs um, in the Court of Appeal. Um, and the issue there was whether a derivative interest in land, such as an easement, could have overreaching uh, effect. And the Court of Appeal decided in that case it could not and if you want to see my case note on that or read it 
look at priorities and registered land during the registration gap, again in the Commerce and Property Lawyer in 2017. So I hope that you've enjoyed listening to aspects of my work uh, with regard to overreaching and um, um, I, I hope that you enjoy uh, uh, reading about uh, the topic more generally in this very, very important uh, uh, aspect of land law. Thank you.